Somehow I have this motherboard. I never used it, I never powered it on and I don't remember why I have it. Never would I have thought to make a video about this motherboard. And now here we are, over 20 years later and I'm sitting here recording the voiceover of today's video. This is the second video in order, based on a survey that I have created a few months ago. The video about the Voodoo 3 is already on my channel, for you to watch after you are done with this one. Over the years this board has been a recurring nuisance, because it always fell in my hands when I was looking for something else. It was shuffled around from basement to attic and stored in drawers and cardboard boxes. Unfortunately, at that time, I was not aware of the danger posed by the batteries commonly found on those motherboards. I had to learn this the hard way and when I finally removed the battery, it was too little, too late. The damage had already been done. But I shouldn't complain too much, since I have seen a lot worse caused by batteries spilling their contents, completely destroying some motherboards in the process. So join me as we take a closer look at this motherboard and see what we can learn from it. But before we get into it, a quick word from my sponsor. PCBWay offers a comprehensive custom PCB prototyping service. I have utilized their PCB manufacturing services on several occasions, both for my own designs and for other projects I have found online. PCBWay has consistently delivered on their promises, impressing me with their quality and reliability. In addition to manufacturing PCBs, they also provide 3D printing and CNC machining services, which I have yet to try out. If you are looking for a professional partner to transform your prototypes into reality, take a look at PCBWay.com by clicking on the link in the video description. This motherboard from Soyo is equipped with an AMD 386DX40, soldered directly to the board. It also had a floating point coprocessor from Cyrix installed. I assume it was used in some business environment where software could actually take advantage of this floating point unit. It is situated right next to the AMD CPU and it's removable on its own socket. Unfortunately, by the time I removed the battery, most of its content had already leaked, covering a portion around the keyboard and power connector. I suspect that over the past years, corrosion continued to spread deeper into the board, damaging the copper traces. Given its current condition, I don't dare to power on this board. Even if it works, it is likely to fail sooner rather than later due to the ongoing corrosion unless the issue is addressed and resolved. I have seen other YouTubers fixing similar problems, including Necroware and CPU Galaxy. So today you will see my attempt in restoring a motherboard that was damaged by a leaky battery. First I will remove the keyboard and the power connector. Both connectors may be affected by corrosion or cover traces that may require attention. Since I do not have a desoldering gun, I will get back to basics and use a simple wig to remove the solder. It is very satisfying to see how the solder attaches to the copper braids. Here are a few of the best shots. It is incredibly sad that some retro hardware from around 30 years ago is forgotten and left to deteriorate. These machines were once the pinnacle of technology representing the cutting edge of their time. They paved the way for the digital age we live in today, yet many of them are now neglected or discarded. Worse still, the few that remain are often in poor condition and will soon become inoperable. Hopefully the fate of this board will be different. Now that we've removed the connectors, we can take a closer look at what we are dealing with. It is certainly not a pretty sight, but it is not as terrible as it could be. I fully believe in myself that I can restore this board. Let me clean the surface with some isopropyl alcohol. Now that the board's surface is clean, we can see clearly the discoloration of traces surrounding the space where the battery was once soldered to the board. I don't know if this is really corrosion that already made it to the copper traces or if it's just the solder mask that changed color. Before I focus on the traces, I want to ensure that the surface of the board and any of the surface mounted components are free from corrosion. Fortunately, it appears that most of the corrosion is limited to the area around where the battery was located. I'm using a brush soaked in white vinegar to neutralize the corrosion. The corrosion of this board is not too bad, so the chemical reaction of the vinegar is very limited here. Peter from CPU Galaxy has a video on his channel where you can see a nice reaction of the vinegar and the corrosion on the board he restores. 
I also removed the cache chips and tried to get into every corner, under and between ICs, sockets and other components. The vinegar effectively neutralizes the corrosion, causing the blue-greenish spots to turn black within seconds. Once the vinegar treatment is completed, I will clean the board again using isopropyl alcohol. Since the affected area is relatively small, there is no need to wash the board under running water. The board looks much better already. Yes, some of the traces still look bad, but hey, step by step we get closer to a nice, hopefully working motherboard. Okay then, let's have a look at the traces. The only solution I could come up with is to remove the solder mask that covers the copper traces. To achieve this, I purchased an engraving pen for around $30. While the pen itself is decent, the included bits are awful. Fortunately, a few of the bits were actually straight, and after struggling with a mounting mechanism for a few minutes, I was able to carefully take off the discolored solder mask. After taking off the questionable solder mask, I applied vinegar again to ensure any remaining corrosion was neutralized. This was just a precaution, just in case the engraving pen couldn't remove all of it. After letting the vinegar sit on the copper traces for a few minutes, I cleaned the entire area once more with isopropyl alcohol. To my surprise, the corrosion has affected the other side of the board as well. This screw hole has seen better days, for sure. Before treating it with vinegar, I decided to remove the dark, discolored solder mask first. The engraving pen was able to handle the larger area quite well, and I may have gotten carried away and removed a bit more of the solder mask than necessary. On the bright side, the other side of the screw hole appeared relatively clean, with no visible corrosion. Nevertheless, I also applied vinegar to this side of the board just to be safe. Now that the motherboard is thoroughly cleaned, it is ready for the next step. Tinning the exposed copper traces. I simply applied flux over the traces and used a hot iron preloaded with solder to go over them. Here is the final result after the tinning process. And I must say, I am pleasantly surprised at how well this repair has progressed so far. The final stage of restoring this motherboard is to apply new solder mask over the exposed traces. I decided to use yellow solder mask to match the original color scheme. Hopefully, my plan will work out as I envision it. Rather than using the provided UV lamp to cure the solder mask, I'm opting to utilize the abundant sunshine available in Dubai. With over 300 sunny days annually, there is no need for a UV lamp. I'll place the board in the sun for around 15 to 20 minutes. Time is up. The solder mask has cured nicely. Looking at it under the microscope, the results are not as impressive as I hoped. There is some spillage around the edges. But there is nothing I can do about it now. Then I took some pictures with my phone. And here it does not look that bad, does it? I am especially pleased with the color of the solder mask, as it matches the original color of the traces almost perfectly. I truly hope that this board will function properly once I reassemble everything. The only thing missing is to reattach the keyboard and power connectors. It feels great to have accomplished this repair so far. If you feel the same, please consider giving this video a like. After being stored for over 20 years, I am eager to find out if this board will actually work. As the board solely features ISA connectors, my hardware choices are quite restricted. The only ISA video adapter I have is from Oak Technology, equipped with an OTI-077 chipset and 512KB of memory. Additionally, a controller card is needed since the motherboard lacks a built-in IDE and floppy controller. The controller card offers a single IDE channel, a floppy connector, one game, one printer and two COM ports. This motherboard was already equipped with 128KB of cache. But we still need to install the main memory. Unfortunately, at the moment I only have 1MB modules. With a total of 8 memory slots, this AMD 386DX40 will have access to 8MB of memory. To maintain the BIOS settings when the board is powered off, 
We need to find an alternative power source for the memory which holds those values. Previously the battery was used for this purpose, but I am not planning on installing another one directly on the board. I have seen some people add a holder for a button cell, but this is dangerous. Those old Varta batteries were rechargeable, and the board will attempt to recharge anything connected to the battery terminals. If you solder a button cell holder and insert a CR2032 for instance, the board will attempt to recharge it. You are going to risk a potential for leakage and in the worst case rupture of the battery. But there is an alternative solution to retain the BIOS settings. Many 386 motherboards have a connector where you can attach an external battery pack. Unlike the onboard battery connectors, the external battery terminals will not recharge the battery connected. I found a plastic case that can hold three AAA batteries and added a connector at the end of the wires. Using three rechargeable batteries with 1.2 volts each, we can get close to the 3.6 volts of the original battery. The manual shows the polarity of the pins of this connector. Okay, I think now we have talked really enough. Let's see if we can get this board to boot. Hey, we get a beep. That is a very good sign. The first boot after at least 20 years. Let's enter the BIOS and see what we can find there. Okay, let's change the colors before we do anything else. This is much better. For me, old BIOS screens need to have a blue background. Now that the correct color scheme is set, we can proceed to change the date, add a floppy disk for drive A and explore other options available in this BIOS. The settings include a test for the numeric coprocessor during boot, the option to enable or disable the external cache and to toggle the turbo button feature. Here we are presented with an option to configure the memory and the cache timings, as well as the wait states and the bus frequency. Let's proceed to boot the system and run some benchmarks to see whether this setup delivers the expected performance for a 386DX40. I'm using my GoTech floppy emulator to boot and run any of the testing tools for now. I did notice that it takes quite a while to boot and loading software takes even longer. I wonder if this is normal. Right off the start, it appears that this CPU is not running at its intended speed. Speedsys reports a 386 clocked at 18 MHz. This could be the reason for the sluggish performance of the system. To verify this, I will check the performance using another tool. System information shows that the main processor is a 386DX with 40 MHz. So far so good. However, when running the benchmark, the performance is much lower than expected even worse than a 386DX33. I wonder if that turbo setting in the BIOS may have something to do with that. Maybe the turbo is off by default. Let me connect the switch and see what happens when I press it. With the turbo switch pressed, we see a jump in the real-time score of the benchmark. To make the CPU work with the maximum performance at all times, we have a few options we can choose from. One option would be to install a physical turbo button. But unfortunately, I don't have a switch that keeps its state and could be used for that purpose. Another option is to use a jumper and short the pins on the motherboard where the turbo button would connect. And the third option, which is the one I will be going with, is to toggle the turbo feature in the BIOS. By deactivating it, I anticipate that the CPU will constantly operate at its maximum performance level. Let's verify the speed once more in system information. And yes, the CPU is now operating at its highest speed and the turbo button no longer has any effect on the performance. Let's connect a hard disk in form of an SD card to IDE adapter. The smallest SD card I have is 2GB. Hopefully the BIOS can detect this card. Oh, wow! The hard disk detection utility managed to detect the disk, including its full capacity. I guess it is time to install good old MS-DOS 6.22. But before we do that, let's format drive C. Ah, so the BIOS detected the full capacity of the 2 GB, but in DOS we now get only around 500 MB. Based on information I found online, this is actually a limitation of most, if not all, 386 BIOSes. Even though it detected the full capacity in its detection tool, the BIOS cannot manage larger disks than around 500 megabytes, But that should still be enough to install MS-DOS 6.22.
With a fresh installation of MS-DOS, I can finally revisit one of my absolute favorite games I played when I was a kid. The original X-Wing, sold on 5 floppy disks. And although I played this game on a much better system back then, an AMD 486DX4 with 100MHz, I hope that this CPU has enough processing power to revive this old classic from 1993. Sir, our TIE interceptors have located a rebel fleet orbiting the planet Torcana. Excellent. Prepare the attack. Move our Star Destroyers within range and launch all TIE Fighter Squadrons. At once, sir. Let me know in the comments if you played this game back in the mid-90s. This is Red Leader. Stay close and watch for enemy fighters. Got it. All I can't take it. I'm on. I shot Red too. But for now, we have reached the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed the content and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel so you won't miss any new video I will upload in the future. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.